And we are back on Sportsman Radio. I'm your host, Chris Shanafelt, and I am now joined by former NFL Pro Bowl nose tackle, Fred Smurlas. Thanks for joining the show tonight, Fred. How's it going? Thanks for having me, Chris. Not too bad. You know, when you get a little bit older and you've been out of the NFL for a number of years and you've been through the old, you know, the old double sessions where you had eight weeks of pads, you feel it when you get older, but I have young kids, so it keeps me out there, and I keep taking care of myself, so things aren't too bad. Hey, sounds good to me. And Fred, I want to start this interview off by talking a bit about your college days, as I see you attended Boston College. I believe you grew up in Massachusetts. Was that one of the main reasons why you decided to stay in stay in the state and uh, go to Boston College? Well, Chris, you know, it, it was a little different for me. My, my dad grew up in a housing project, and he, became, he was an All-American player for Ringe Tech, uh, with Patrick Ewing came out of, and he went to the University of Georgia and started for, for was a starting guy for the University of Georgia, so he, when he got out of the city, he moved into a blue-collar city, Walter, right outside of Boston, and I grew up, I never played sport, he was working all the time, so he was around, my, my uh, oldest brother was like a child prodigy, he could do anything, I was kind of like the fat little kid, <laughs> I just beat up a little bit, but... When I got to junior high school, it wasn't a great school, and, you know, it was a rough experience. So I was, I started training to defend myself, you know, boxing and lifting. And all of a sudden, my, my, one day my buddies caught me off and went off of football in the ninth grade. And I went out and I had that little bit of itch, you know, for being a, for becoming aggressive to defend yourself in school. And I was good at it. I didn't like it that much, but I was good at it. And then my sophomore year, I went out for wrestling. I was at my, uh, all, I was fifth in the state my sophomore year and was all American my second year in two sports. So it kind of came quickly for me. I didn't really know any colleges around. You know, they'd be coming up my house in Michigan or Notre Dame, and I'd come home and they'd be showing me films. I'm like, dude, I finally said, you know what, I'm going to go to Boston College. It's seven miles down the street. They play a decent schedule. I can hang with my guys. And... Uh, it's a good edu- education. So, you know, the, the proximity to where I live was one of the reasons. And the second reason was everyone was bugging me, so I just wanted to stop. And, I would, and, and, and the education, because my teachers would say to me, you know, you're probably not going to make the pros. You better, you better, you know, get an education while you can. So, Boston College had a good education, decent football, so I went there. And overall, how was your college experience there at Boston College? Well, Chris, college is a little different than it is now. You know, <laughs> you, you could do a few more things. You didn't have so many pe- people scrutinizing you with those cell phones and the, uh, you know, and everyone reporting on everything you're doing. So it, it was, it was probably a little wilder than it is now. But my college experience, I met some unbelievably great guys. I had uh, uh, some great roommates and Boston College connections around here are great. So. I enjoyed college. I tell the kids now, even if I could have come out as a sophomore or a junior, I would never have come out because you don't get that back. You know, when you get to the pros, there's big smelly guys around, not pretty girls yeah. walking around on the campus. I mean, enjoy life, my friend. So I enjoyed it. And if I had to do it again, I'd probably go to Boston College again. It was great. And I'm sure, you know, you really did make the right choice by staying in college because even after your NFL career, you know, you don't know how, it, you know, how your life will be after the NFL. I mean, you, you, I mean, I'm sure you didn't do this, but we hear about NFL players all the time blowing their money and, you know, uh, going bankrupt, you know. So I'm sure you made the right decision by staying at college. You know, Chris, we had talked about this before the show, but... More of these kids, everyone thinks all oh, these kids are big dummies and everything else, but they're just kids. They have no idea. And I went through it, so I know. When you get out of college, you're 21 to 23 or 4 years old, right? Most kids had no money, had no understanding of what money was, got enough money for a lunch, and then all of a sudden, the superstars in high school are getting touted around, they're getting meals bought for them, they're getting driven around in big cars, and everyone's talking to them, they feel pretty good about themselves. And if you're an athlete that goes through college at a high level of playing, when you're getting finished with your senior year, right, everyone's coming after you. Now the junior year, everyone's coming at you talking about how much money you're going to make. So you feel like you're on top of the world. And then you get that money. The first thing you want to do is show everybody that you have that money. Yeah. But no one's ever taught you that you may only get that money for five or six years and you're going to project long term. And Very few kids do that. So the foundation for the economics in life is have not even been had the first brick put in it when they've given $10, 20000000 million or what they get up for, for a contract. 
And so they blow most of it. And if they last long enough, they finally figure out, because, uh, you know, after a while, they go, wow, I just had 10 million bucks, now I get nothing left. And I didn't realize I only get 5 million to take home. They start catching on. So if they last long enough, they'll have some money. But unfortunately, for most kids, you won't. But you got to learn, if you have parents, they can tell you, put some money away, spend as little as you can until you get out and figure out what you want to do. Because there's so many pitfalls for these young kids. I, I think it was 85% of the people that get out of the NFL by their fifth or sixth year, they're broke. So wow. that is one of the pitfalls of the NFL is getting so much, or any professional sports, is getting that kind of money early before you understand what to do with it. Fred, you were drafted in the second round of the 1979 NFL draft by the Buffalo Bills. Uh, pretty much, how was that moment for you just to be drafted into the NFL? Well, Chris, I was the number one rated tackle in the nation. I was projected to go in the top ten. But they thought I had some uh, some anger issues because a lot of kids who I was playing against them in college would, would always smash their jaws off my hands and stuff <laughs> in the back of their heads because it was... You know, I, I learned at an early age that I could make kids quit. A lot of kids weren't that tough. You know, and I was I was physically better than most of the kids I played against. So if I intimidated them early and talked a little bit, bit, a bit to them or smashed them a little bit harder than they normally get smashed and beat them ways they never got beat, and I could intimidate them and um, and have them quit and make my job early easier. Uh, so. After the season was over, I think I overdid it, so some of the teams were apprehensive about drafting me that high, and I dropped in the second round. And I was at, at home, I mean, at my dorm, and I got a call from Tampa Bay, and they're going, oh, Fritz Merlis, we can't believe you're still here. I said, I can't either. But I said, Buffalo Bills in there, and they're going to draft Greg Roberts, the outland coach who went up from uh, Oklahoma, and we're going to draft you. I'm like, oh, my God, my life's over. I'm going to Tampa. I think that was the second year in the NFL, right, whenever it was, the third year. And so finally, I gets back on and says, Buffalo draft you, hung up. And Chuck Knox, who was a blue-collar street kid, gets on and starts swearing at me and asking me if I'm a tough SOB and I'm going to smash people's heads in. I'm like, it's not quite what I expected. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, I went up there with a little bit of chip on my shoulder because I did drop to the second round because of whatever. And, um, but Buffalo was perfect. We had my like, greatest group of guys you want to meet. They had, you know, best friends in defense and offensive line, coaches that were great, so... The experience was great. It was frustrating dropping that far because it takes you a while to catch up on money that you lost when you drop down, you know, 10, 15 spots. So it was, it was a frustrating day, but I loved where I went. Was there any veterans on that Bills team that would make you or any of the other rookies do anything like carry the film, carry pads, you know, give you guys a funny haircut like they do to rookies nowadays? Well, at that team, it was such disarray because it was Chuck Knox's second year. And I met my roommate. I was the first uh, interracial roommate in Buffalo. My first roommate was a guy named Baby Johnson. He was six, six, three hundred thirty pounds, and uh, one of the sweetest human beings you want to meet. The baby, me, Jimmy Hazard, who works for Washington. I mean, it was. We had a great group of rookies, and I was a pretty out of control, three hundred pound Greek guy with, that was a wrestler. All I wanted to do was, you know, fight veterans. So they. They really didn't do that much to us. We did more stuff to them, like we used to put 50-gallon buckets of water on their doors at training camp and tie their doors so would only open halfway up to the other door across the way and the water would not bend. And, you know, we'd put the, uh, they got us the last night, though. They came up and tied us up and filled us with foam and dragged us down the hall. So. <laughs> but they, you know what, Chris? The NFL back then, because there was a lot less money and everyone stuck to, stuck together more, we had a lot more camaraderie. So there was a lot of pranks. We pulled most of them, but they got us with a couple of them. And Fred, what would you say was the toughest transition you had to make from the college game to the professional level? Uh, no curfew. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, you know, you get up there, all of a sudden it's not coaches watching everything you do and your grades and all that stuff and learning that not be out of control a lot, all the time. A lot of kids can't do that, and they, they get blown away in, um, in camp. Second of all, there is no one that really cares about you. You know, the, the coaches you have you in college, you're there for four years. The pros, they can cut you any time they want. It's more of a cold-blooded type business. Um, and a length of things, you know, we went double sessions once, uh, eight weeks. Eight weeks of doubles in pads. Now I think if you do one day, you get four days off. I think you go four days of double the entire year. So the the, the, the amount of pain you went through, and um, that was 
that was very difficult. And then finding things on your own. You had to go get your apartment and get guys to live with. But once you get acclimated and the second like, in the year starts, it's great. But that whole thing hit you in the face was a little bit of a tough transition. Was there ever that one team that you always looked forward to playing and, you know, getting after their quarterback? You know who that is. Uh. Who does everyone in the AFC hate? And that's the Jets. <laughs> we hated the Jets back then. Even though I was friends with a couple guys, Klecko and a guy named Gaston, who was kind of out of his mind. But I hated the Jets, man. We wanted to pound the crap out of them every time we fought them. We had a big fight in the field. They fired us all once with the, the who was it? The, uh, one of the kids, Chief Sarda, Joe Ferguson, were playing them. Old Joe. But the Jets we hated when I was with the, when, um, when I was with the Bills, and then I was with the Patriots, I hated the Jets. My family would kind of hand me something because I get a lot of pub, and they're always warm. You know, we were freezing our butts off. And then um, the, the Patriots, when I was in Buffalo, they were counted, and we, it was kind of a rivalry. But the Jets, there was bad blood everywhere. Because, you know, I would be in Buffalo, and I have three sacks and ten tackles. I wouldn't even make the paper. Uh, someone down in New York would cut wind, and they'd get in the front page of the, of the post or something. So they get all the pub, and we were jealous, and they talked a little bit of trash, so we want to get them back. <laughs> Uh, now, Fred, I believe it was in your uh, second season in the NFL. You guys had a huge win over the Miami Dolphins after falling short against them for, uh, I believe, 20 straight years. Does that sound about right to you, Fred? I think it was 10 years, 20 times. Oh, all right. Then, yeah. that. We, I think we beat them in, it was in 80. The first time we beat them, we beat them. We had them beat in 19... No, we... I know we had Dempsey when I was a junior. I mean, when I said junior, when I was a second year, Dempsey with the short, we had a cut off foot and a cut off arm. He missed a field goal. We lost nine seven. So I'm trying to think of the first year we beat. That might have been nineteen eighty one. Was it eighty one? Eighty one or eighty? Oh uh, well. Yeah, the we- stats. Yeah, when I when I was uh, looking up, you know, doing the research for the interview, I, I seen it. It did say nineteen eighty, I believe. Yeah, we played them twice. We beat them the, I think we beat them the second time. But we had a, uh, I think we had number one defense in the NFL. We had one of the great defensive ends, uh, Ben Williams. Was, he was a Pro Bowl player that year. He was a, a real mentor to me. He was the first black player in the history of, I think it was Mississippi State, 1973. You know, he's kind of the guy that was like a great uncle. He'd keep us in line, you know, teach us about economics. He had a bank. So we had an unbelievable group of guys, and we had a decent offense, and I think we are 11 and 5 that year, so we probably beat them. That was a, that was one of the better teams I've ever played on with the Bills was that team. But it was, you know, it, it, Chuck Knox would always talk about Shula, and his pregame speech was, you're going to get that jaw, Shula, with that big jaw. I want you to run by there and elbow with that jaw off, you know. He just had to stay in, because Shula got all the pub. Even though Chuck Knox had a ton of wins, Shula got all the pub. He never got any credit. We're up there in the freezing cold. Shula's down there getting cans. He'd go through that whole thing. So he, Chuck Knox was a guy that kind of kept that rivalry fired up inside everyone. You helped carry the Buffalo Bills to their first AFC Championship game appearance that season. Can you tell us about the journey yourself and the team had to, uh, you know, go on to make it to the playoffs? You know what? I'll give a lot of credit to Chuck. Chuck wanted to have the AFC. He wanted to have the Raiders of the East. He brought in Conrad Dobler and Villapiano and Larry McCutcheon and. You know, Jesse and uh, Ron Jesse, we brought him myself and Hazlitt. He had offensive lines, Jim Richard and I mean, Devlin and Ferguson and, you know, Roosevelt Leaks. I mean, we had a, a, a great team and everyone got along. It was one of those uh, uh, just great experiences coming from, we were 7 to 9 the year before, and we built on that with that, um, with that first playoff playoff appearance in, I don't know, 105 years. But it was about attitude. We had a great attitude. Uh, we thought we, we didn't think we could be beat. We did get beat, but, uh, and that was very disappointing. But it was, we had such great camaraderie on and off the field. We had players that could do multiple things like they do today. You know, you can pass rush, you can play the run, you can do all types of things, smart enough to pick up concepts that they wanted to. But that win and the people in Buffalo, fan reaction, it was just unbelievable. That was also your first season making it to the NFL Pro Bowl, and as we know, you would go on to make five appearances. What did it mean to you to be voted to the Pro Bowl five times by the NFL players, coaches, and fans? Well, it was an interesting experience, because 
I didn't even realize, you know, the, uh, in my rookie year, I was, I was on our rookie team, and then the second year, at the end, the coach was going, I think you're going to make the Pro Bowl. And I was actually running up Defensive Player of the Year to um, uh, Lester Hayes from the Rangers, who had 16 interceptions. And I, and I went to the Pro Bowl, and I walk in, and there's Webster, and, you know, there's Franco Harris, and, and uh, Earl Campbell, and uh, I'm like, wait a minute, Bradshaw, I'm like, holy, oh, Ted Hendricks, I'm just sitting there going, you know, two years ago, I was, I was watching these guys on TV with my buddies, and I, here I am, Jack Lambert, Jack, when I was there, he designated me as the driver, so I had to pick up beer for him, put it in the cool, and have it in the locker room after the game, I mean, after practices, it was, it was, it was a great experience, and to see how human these guys were, the greatest players were the greatest guys, like Lester Hayes from the Raiders, remember him with all the stick and stuff, one of the great guys of all time, I mean, we get to be great friends with Walter Payton, who I, I met at the airport on the way out, and Walter goes, uh, met my parents, and I come out to lunch with them, and Walter had bought lunch for my parents, and he say, geez, this guy, it's Walter Payton, you know, this guy is uh, Jack Lambert, and it's very nice. I was really surprised that once you're inside that group, they're very, they let down their guard, you know, they're protective a little bit with the uh, reporters, because reporters are mostly vipers, except for you, Chris. And so, once you're in the group, they're much more friendly, and, they're, and just surprised how human they were. I was humbled when I went out there, because I'm going to see guys that were like my idols, and now I'm out there with them, and to see how great they were, just humbled me. It was a humbling experience. Now, Fred, I'm going to go off track real quick. You mentioned Walter Payton. I don't know if you know this or not, Fred. You do know I'm from Chicago. I'm a huge Chicago Bears fan. And, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're one of the best defensive uh, linemen out there. What, what are your thoughts on that 1985 Chicago Bears defense? I mean, many call it the best of all time. Well, it's funny because they call it the 4-6. I didn't know they called it that because of Fensick, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I that's, do believe that's so. That's why they call it 4-6. Yeah, I was, um, well, you know, Hampton was drafted the year I was drafted. I was good friends with Steve McMichaels. I knew those two guys. Walter Payton was my, I thought he was the greatest, not only an unbelievable person when I met him, but I thought he was, I think he is the greatest overall ball player ever because he could catch, he could block, he could run, he could go inside, he could go outside, he could go short yardage, you name it, he could do it, he could catch the ball. So, you know, I always loved him and, of course, Dick Buckus, who didn't love him. But I thought they had a great, the right matchup of people on that defense that could do so many things. You had the outside ends that could rush, they had your inside guys that could push the pocket back, they had coverage guys, linebackers that could bang, they had multiple blitz schemes, they mixed it up well, they, they challenged you at the line to change up your blocking schemes. I thought brains and versatility on that team separated them from just bulk. You know, a lot of times people line up that 3-4, the 4-3, run a lot of straight defenses. But that was the best defense I've ever seen ever in my in watching. We played them and they beat us. We were both undefeated that year. But that was the best defense ever. You know, I think um, some of the camaraderie got skewed when you know, when ego started growing. You know, with some of the guys taking, I think it was taking too many commercials and the guys got jealous. You know, they had so much success. I think that kind of screwed them up. But that team should have won a couple Super Bowls. They were that good. So I, I thought that was the best defense I've ever seen because of strength, smarts, speed, toughness, everything. They had the whole package. And what did players like yourself back then think when the Chicago Bears made that Super Bowl shuffle video before they won the Super Bowl? <laughs> well, you know what? I remember playing with San Francisco. I didn't, I didn't really think much of it. And then when I came back from Super Bowl, San Francisco, we lost to the Giants. People are going crazy about how San Francisco had made all the plans already. But they got to do it in preparation because you're not going to have any time when you go out there. So it's kind of like when I was, uh, um, I think it was 1988, uh, Sports, uh, People Magazine did an article on me and did an article on Boomer Science. And if we got in the Super Bowl, the article would run on me. And if Boomer got in the Super Bowl, they were going to do it on him. So they already did the article. It wasn't after the Super Bowl, but it ran right when the Super Bowl started. So, you know, that would have, they would have buried it if they didn't play it before they were, uh, if they didn't um, win the Super Bowl, but they did win. Then it comes out they did it beforehand. 
And then I think the Patriots did one later on, but it wasn't quite as good. I mean, <laughs> you had so many characters. You know, you had the Frick, and you had McMahon, and you had, you know, Walt, the great Walter Payton. And you had so many different guys. It was easily, it was an easy a decision to make a goofy or, or a video like that for that team. You guys are listening to Sportsman Radio. I'm your host, Chris Shanfeld, talking with former NFL defensive lineman Fred Smurlos. And Fred, you would play with the Buffalo Bills from 1979 through 1989 and then played a season with the 49ers and I believe two seasons with the New England Patriots. At first, how different was it for you to be with the Buffalo Bills franchise for 10 seasons and then go on to San Francisco and play with the 49ers? Well, it was 11 seasons in Buffalo, so, but it was, it was so different because in Buffalo, you know, when it's uh, October or, or September, it starts getting cloudy and the, and the clouds come in and the snow comes in and the cold comes in and you're, you know, it's very difficult to practice when you get late to November, December. So then I go to San Fran and I hadn't been hurt. I started 156 games in a row and played 98% of all plays, so I hadn't been hurt. And I had a scope right when I went out there and I was doing um, mini camp and I fractured my knee joint. I didn't realize I had no, I didn't have any cartilage in my joint. And so I chipped the bones in, in the, on the knee. And when I had a scope, I, they said you might never heal. You have to either do this exotic surgery or ride the bike. And no weight on it to wear it down. So that whole thing was like had me befuddled. And my wife looked at me and said, "Either do it or don't, or, or stop and don't do it." And I said, "Well, I'll work my butt off and get back into shape." But it's November; it's eighty degrees there in Buffalo. It's you know twenty, and there were the, you know that snow-capped mountains with sun all the time, and and no one really cared that much about football. You know, some of the people did, but. Buffalo, everyone lives football. Chicago, you know, they live football. Out there was more of a lackadaisical attitude. I hadn't been, I was an established star in Buffalo, and I wasn't out there, and I was doing okay, and then I got hurt, and then I came back, and, um, and I started getting into it, and that changed a little bit, so I was getting acclimated, but being born out here and playing in this type of environment and weather, it's so much different than San Francisco. It was, it was hard getting used to it, but they had, they also had some phenomenal guys, you know, Roger Craig and Jerry Rice and Mark Tanner and that backup, you know, Young and Rathman. I mean, they had they had a wagon. The defense, they had a lot of good players. You know what else is funny? You know who the water boy was for that team? Uh, John. Who? John Gruden. Oh, wow. You know, that, that's kind of <laughs> like this, that, That's kind of like the same thing with Larry Fitzgerald as he was the water, uh, no, he was the, uh, uh, yeah, I believe he was a water boy for the Minnesota Vikings, and now yeah. now look at him playing for the Cardinals. Yeah, I, I thought that was, I didn't know that until he wrote his book, and then, you know, Holgram was there, he was a phenomenal guy, Seifert was there, and Ray Rhodes was there, he went up to Seattle, really great guy, so they had, they had just, they had a great organization, once they had acclimated to the whole thing, halfway through the season, my knee started healing, and funny, because they were going to activate me, I think we were 10-1, and one, they were going to activate me, and then... The day passed that they said they were going to uh, activate me. And see if it came up to me the next day and said, I obviously didn't get, uh, we didn't uh, activate you. I said, George, you can do what you want. You brought me out here, anything you need. He goes, listen, you've been great. And if you, um, uh, you know, we're 10 and 1, we don't want to disrupt anything. I said, you don't have to explain anything to me. He goes, but if we do get in the Super Bowl, you know, as it, he goes, I'm going to let you run one at fullback if we play Buffalo. So. That would have been great. I hope I didn't fumble, but they were, they were great guys, different environment, and I can see how guys get screwed up when they get changed after you've been good at some places so long, and everything's totally different. All right, Fred, I'm going to switch gears and ask you a few fun, quick questions. Does that sound good? Sounds good, brother. All right, what is Fred Smurla's favorite TV show and movie? Jeez, favorite TV show? Right now, it's probably Lost. You know, my, in the past, growing up, it was it was Star Trek. I was a Trekkie, so I had a light little phaser and stuff. Uh, <laughs> I, um, and then my favorite movie, geez, there's so many of them I watched. There was one called Three O'Clock High about some punk that went to school. It was very funny. Uh, the Ninth Configuration is one of my favorite movies. Go pick that up. You'll enjoy it. And there's a bunch of them. So I, I'm, I love movies. I thought the Harry Potter series was great. The Star Trek uh, movies were great. Star Wars were great. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Trekkie. I like sci-fi stuff. All right, favorite thing to eat? Dude, I'm Greek. 
<laughs> I'm eating everything that walk, crawl, the rolls. I, eat, I, I was a meatarian until I was 30. That means I only ate meat. <laughs> Vegetables made me sick. And I graduated high school at 285 pounds, benching 450. So I, I eat everything. The only thing I didn't like in my life was lamb's heads. My grandmother would call it yaya in Greek. Yaya wanted me to eat lamb's heads. They pull them out of the oven. They're smiling at me. I'm like, I'm not eating that, yaya. <laughs> and she was four foot three. And I didn't eat. I didn't like raw sea urchin. That's a sushi thing. If you ever hear sea urchin, stay away from it. <laughs> Will do. Thanks for the advice, Fred. Except for football, what is your favorite sport? I was an all-American wrestler in high school, and I really enjoyed that, and I loved watching it. Uh, my, my dad was an all-American hoop player, so we played hoop every off-season all the time. I mean, I play it, and I love watching hoop. Of course, pour up in Boston with the Celtics, right? You have a team out there, too, right? Isn't there oh, yeah. a, a decent team in Chicago? Oh, yeah. You remember those rivalries? That was unbelievable. Uh, like hockey? Yep. You know, yep. grew up playing hockey. It was a great thing. All my Most of my friends grew up were Irish, so we didn't want to give them sticks because they get hit you in the head with them. But, um, yeah, basketball, hockey, love wrestling. I even like tennis back when all the crazy guys like McEnroe playing. So I, I enjoy a lot of sports. I don't I don't watch golf because I consider that like tiddlywinks, but <laughs> basketball, hockey, and um, I'm enjoying lacrosse now. My youngest kid plays that, so that's a, another one I like. All right, you mentioned wrestling, and I know you said you're, what, like 285 pounds in high school. Uh, I actually wrestled two years, and I was actually a smaller guy, 98 pounds and 103. <laughs> well, that's, I ate that stuff, didn't I? Uh, but, you know, I, thought, I think wrestling, and I love wrestling. I mean, I, it's, you know, a wrestler, mm -hmm. it has the best athletes. Because you have a 100-pound kid that can't play football, basketball, but he's a great athlete, and now he gets to wrestle against kids his own size. Yeah. And, so and, you, you can, go ahead. and if you lose, there's no one else to blame on but yourself. You can't blame a team or anybody on your team. You have to blame yourself. That's right. And me makes you become a man. Quick funny story. My first wrestling match when I was a sophomore, 205 pounds. I was lifting, but I was skinny. And I was, I was strong. And, and I was starting wrestling as a sophomore my first year. I go out and wrestle this guy about 90 pounds, he's snorting and grinding like a pig. I'm like, oh, dude. So I shot a double, and I didn't, I was quick, but I didn't have the technique down. I left my elbows out, and he underhooked me. He pinned, he pinned me in 17 seconds, and he threw his helmet down, started stomping around the match. And I'm like, damn. So I, you know, asked the coach, fundamentally help me get sound. I used to shoot walk a thousand times, keep the elbows in, the hands through. I started out one and four, I ended up 25 and five. And Russell, I was gonna wrestle him in the, in the, in the semis, in the, I mean, the quarters of the state my sophomore year, and he ended up getting beat by so mad I went out and picked the kid in 12 seconds that beat him. Uh, so, but it taught me, you know, keep your hands in, your arms in, head back, back arch, leg spread. You know, when you shoot, and if you make a mistake and get sloppy, especially at that anyway, you can get pl plowed. And it became healthy in football, become a better technician at learning how to observe what I did wrong and correct it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, you know, no, no match is going to be the same, even if you wrestle the same guy. That's right. When you go to, and you said, no one there to console you. When you lose your match, if the rest of the team, even if you win, it's not like football when you lose together, the win together. You lose, you lose. Yep. And you yep. have to learn how to cope with that and not be a baby and, and wake because you, know, you get so many matches and face the, face reality. I got to wrestle again maybe in two days or in a tournament. I got to wrestle in a half an hour. Yep. And that helps, helps you develop. Mm -hmm. Fred, if you can meet any famous person, who would that be? Meet any famous person? Yep. It'd be Jesus Christ. All right, all right. No, no I reason. I think that's there. the most famous person <laughs> I would want to meet. He started the Freedom of America, Freedom of Our World. Yeah, yeah. You got that right. And I, I see you're on Twitter at Fred Smurlos. You every morning I see you on Twitter interacting with your fans. Why do you make it important to connect with your fans? You know, I've been doing radio and television since 1981. You know, radio shows. We got a radio talk show. You interact. With forth and my wife got me on doing the Twitter says you know this is a way we can sit and chat with people that want to hear things from you from all over the country really very uninvasive invasive because you know, he could tweet back if you want if someone's being a wise a wise guy you don't have to but I, I think people like to talk to the old timers and our perspective on things and I still follow sports so we enjoy it. we enjoy people that appreciate what we did and we appreciate them following us and uh, and uh, giving us the fan base that we have so 
I enjoy talking to people, and I, and, you know, I appreciate the fans and the sport and what they've done for me. All right, sounds good. And Fred, I really appreciate your time tonight. Lastly, I got to get your thoughts on this year's Bills team. As we know, they were held to high expectations last season from landing the biggest free agent player in Super Mario Williams. Uh, they ended the season 6-10. and 10. Since then, they fired head coach Chan Gailey, released quarterback Ryan Fitzpatrick, and have actually just recently signed quarterback Kevin Cobb. <laughs> what are your thoughts on all those moves that are being made in Buffalo? Same thoughts as you have. Yeah. I like the new coach they brought in. I th- when I brought Chan Gailey in, I almost passed out. I'm like, dude, I thought he retired seven years ago. Yeah. When actually he did. Uh, 13 years of not making the playoffs, it, it goes deeper than players and administration. It goes deeper all the way to the heart of the problem. Because, come on, you don't bring in Mario Williams. I never loved Mario Williams to start with. But he's a defensive end. He's not Bruce Smith. Right? You're not going to... You pay him all that kind of money, and you forget about one, about two things that makes a team great. A quarterback and a coach. Bill Belichick, Tom Brady, you look down the line with coaches. You bring in the Harbaugh brothers, and you give them a decent coach, a quarterback, and all of a sudden, they're in the Super Bowl, right? Yeah. you got to have a coach, and you got to have a quarterback that can do, deliver the package and understand the concepts of the co- quarterback the coach wants you. Mario Williams, well, they're up by 10 points. They're going to run the ball. What, what is Mario Williams? If you, any part of a game, a quarterback touches the ball every play. And for some reason, the Buffalo Bills never got that. They brought uh, you know, Fitzpatrick in, $68 million for, yeah. for a career backup guy and a nice fellow, right? He's probably make more money when he gets out because he's a Harvard guy than he was yeah. when he was in, and then you signed Cobb? Did I miss something here? Oh, wait, you're telling me the Bills can't win without Kevin Cobb. <laughs> I, I, you know what? I thought all along, if they just got Cobb, I've been saying it for the last five years, boy, I wish they had not Brady, not Manning, not Flacco, not Capa- uh, um, Kaepernick, not these guys. I want Cobb. Forget Smith, the friend. Forget all those guys. Bring in Cobb. Right? I said, you know, when Michael Vick was available and, and, uh, and, and the, the Eagles were going to take him, I said, why not take Michael Vick? At least it's a, you're not bringing in uh, Terrell Owens, who's um, out of his mind and can only do one thing, is catch the ball if it's thrown to him. At least Vick can run with the ball, catch the ball. He can throw the ball, and he's a quarterback who brings some excitement and actually put another dimension to that team. And they just kept bringing in, you know, these. they brought Bledsoe in. I think Belichick's going to trade the a guy to a team in his own division that's going to hurt him? Mm-hmm. Not on your life. And then they trade for Johnson. Remember? Down in, and, and he came up. He was absolutely horrible. Oh. He, they put Johnson in ahead of Flutie after his Pro Bowl season into the playoffs. Nobody would do that. Mm-hmm. And found out later on it was Ralph. Nobody would do that. They cut their own throat. Then they trade a first round pick for, what was it, uh, um, the kid out of Tulane. They get a first round pick for him. They picked him in the first round. I talked to some other coaches like, we would have took him in the third round. And he bombed. And then Trent Edwards, he bombed. I mean, come on, who's picking these players? Mm. So, and then Cobb, uh, he goes there, he looks like he looks like he's afraid, standing in the pocket. I mean, I want some guy with some innovation and some guy, you know, what, what they take Wilson in the third round or fifth round, they uh, take yep. uh, Kaepernick in the second round. I mean, the Bills could have picked, does anyone how can't you see those intangibles that this kid has? Anyway, <laughs> uh, they need a quarterback. They need someone picking the players to do a better job. Don't bring in a, a, a free agent. Like, the Patriots don't dump that kind. They made one mistake, and they brought in, what's the name, from, uh, from uh, uh, the Ravens, uh, the, the, the linebacker, and he ended up being a bum. But you got to put... Your offense, it's all offense now. You can't whack guys, you can't intimidate guys, you can't tear them at the line of scrimmage, right? Mm-hmm. It's going to be more points. You got, you need an offense that can put points on the board. You know, right? Your guy going to put yeah. more points on the board. Oh, yeah. Oh, so yeah. that's how it is. More points, quarterback and coach. That's what you need. Yep, you got that right. And, you know, here in Chicago, I'm looking forward to seeing what Mark Tressman and Jay Culler could do. And, Fred, with all that being said, man, I really appreciate your time tonight. It was really a great honor to have you on the show. And maybe we could do it again later on in the season, uh, maybe update on the Buffalo Bills. (laughs) Sounds good, brother. Listen, you're you're a high school kid. You have a nice life in front of you. You're very good at what you do. Follow your dreams. You know, I always say this. Don't have dreams, because those are for people who sleep. Have ambitions, because even if you don't get the ambition you set out to get, you'll get strong along the way and find success. You're going to find success, my friend, so you know where to find me, you want me to come back on.
All right, sounds good. Hey, Fred, before I let you go, is there anything you'd like to plug on the air for myself and our listeners? No, just give me a If you want to tweet me, it's at Fred Smurlis, at Fred Smurlis, and come on board, and I'm sitting here with my phone uh, answer questions and chat with you. All right, sounds good. Hey, thanks again for your time, and take care. All right, buddy. Good luck. Thanks.